I do have a, yes, a PowerPoint a, presentation. A PowerPoint. I'm not used to going first. The business I'm in, we're, we deal in the tail end of things, so. <laughs> yeah, this is um, backwards. That's right, it is backwards. Um, as Dr. Garris said, um, I graduated from LMU, uh, or from Loyola University at the time. I won't tell you how many years ago. Long time ago, though. Well, you were one of Dr. Fitzgerald's students, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the great Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, and with a degree in civil engineering and then pursued a career uh, in environmental engineering. And the organization that I work for, very similar to a school district, it's not part of county government, it's a special district, for those of you in political science. It's a special district uh, governed by uh, the mayors of 78 of the 88 cities in Los Angeles County for the very specific purpose of, uh, of the collection, this, uh, collection treatment and disposal, and as you'll see in a minute with some of the slides that I have, the reuse of wastewater and also uh, involved in solid waste management. Now, what Dr. Garrett didn't tell you was Ron Gustalem also in his um, life prior to uh, being the guru of water uh, for uh, the Metropolitan Water Districts was also involved in the private sector in solid waste management. And it, it's a very fascinating field, both wastewater and solid waste management, because you are dealing with something that uh, society doesn't want. Uh, for example, on, on the wastewater side of it, uh, to be uh, just cut to it and be frank about it, uh, you flush it, you want it to go away, and you don't want to see it again. And when you put it on the curb in the garbage can, uh, you want it picked up, and you'd like it picked up often. You don't want to pay an awful lot, and you don't want to see it again. Uh, and that includes the recyclables that you put out there. So from that standpoint, um, in operating a business, uh, it is, uh, it's difficult because you're starting off with the negative. And the challenge is to turn that negative into a positive. And there are some um, excellent technological advances that have allowed us to be able uh, to do that. Now, I just got, I'm going to go through this quickly, and I, I think it's about 10 minutes. Sure. Okay. I'm going to go through this quickly to lay out both wastewater and solid waste for you and start off. Uh, yeah, go to the next one. The, the, the map, and it's kind of hard to see, uh, tried to squeeze in on this map here, the names of all of the, the 78 cities that we serve. Uh, that uh, area uh, is Los Angeles County, uh, and there are 88 cities in Los Angeles County, the largest of which is the city of Los Angeles, and they uh, are uh, one, of the, uh, one of the better run city governments in, in, in the United States. Uh, and certainly uh, Dominic's going to talk to you about their responsibilities uh, in, in water and power for the city of L.A. But for everything outside of the city of L.A., essentially, it's served by the organization uh, that, that I head up called the County Sanitation Districts of L.A. County for the specific purpose of handling um, wastewater and, um, and, and, and solid waste. And all of the names of the 78 cities are in there, and you can see uh, we go as far north as Lancaster and Palmdale, the fast-growing area of the Santa Clarita Valley. And if you've been up to Magic Mountain, that's the area that I'm, that I'm talking about. And then south of the San Gabriels, all of those colored jurisdictions are these uh, many uh, small, large cities, Long Beach, Torrance, or the larger ones, Pasadena, 78 of these cities. Um, and, and it's 25 separate districts, and the boards of directors are made up of the city mayors and the chair of the county board of supervisors. So um, I have a panel of bosses, if you will, made up of the mayors of these, uh, of these 78 cities. And it's in law that the mayor sits as the, as the representative. It can't be uh, the mayor's cousin who happens to be a sewer contractor. Uh, it, it's the mayor. Uh, and, and there is, in some ways, a collegiality uh, devoid of the politics that you will see in a city council room because they sit there uh, talking with their brother or sister from the adjacent city, mayor to mayor. And so there's more of a, a, a business atmosphere that's worked well for us over the years. We were founded uh, in, in uh, 1923, so we've been around for a long, long time uh, functioning, uh, as I talked about. And we, we provide uh, water and wastewater, I mean uh, water, uh, wastewater treatment and solid waste management. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, click it again for me, please. Here's L.A. County. You know, the, the, you get one more click, please. 
the sewerage system, this in, in gold here, is the sewerage system of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and they're out the ball. A lot of you uh, have probably toured or know of, of the Hyperion plant, which is located just south of the uh, western edge of, of LAX runway, right off of, uh, uh, off of uh, Imperial Highway. Uh, and they discharge their treated wastewater out into Santa Monica Bay proper. Uh, and it is a, a massive system. And what I refer to here is the cache umbilical cord um, that ties the, the uh, city of LA proper uh, to LA Harbor uh, in the San Pedro area. And then click the next one, please. And then the Orange County Sanitation Districts to the south, and then click it again, and the uh, Inland Empire Utility Agency, which handles wastewater treatment uh, in, in, um, in the uh, San Bernardino area. And then click again, please. And so the rest of that map is filled out by the sanitation districts of LA County. Uh, the yellow represents major trunk lines or sewers. Uh, you've got to collect everything that comes out of your house. And then the blue dots represent water reclamation plants. And our main facility is located in the city of Carson and what water we aren't able to reclaim and reuse uh, is uh, put out into uh, the Pacific Ocean uh, right off of uh, White's Point uh, on the border between Rancho PD and the city of LA. Go to the next dot. Now, uh, those of you that uh, enjoy looking at uh, graphs of the history of, of growth and sewers in Los Angeles County, I get out of the way here, starting in 1940, this top line in yellow represents the amount of sewage. Well, after uh, World War II, you can see the steep growth in the population uh, in L.A. County. And uh, more growth, more people, more sewage. And so this top line represents the total amount of flow uh, to Los Angeles County. And uh, a million people is about 100 million gallons a day. So our service area serves about five, five and a half million people. And one of the things that our organization is exceptionally proud of is that beginning in, uh, in 1960, uh, we designed and, uh, and instituted, uh, started operation of a water reclamation plant that reclaimed a tremendous amount of water that prior to that time was wasting to the ocean. Makes good environmental sense. Uh, and as Ron will talk to you later about uh, the metropolitan water districts and trying to find alternative water supplies, uh, reclaimed water can be treated to a level where it can be used. In fact, it's used on this campus for irrigation. Uh, and you, uh, you can use it for a number of different uh, groundwater recharge, a number of different uses. And ever since uh, that plant started, we've built an infrastructure of other treatment plants. And you can see now the flow to the ocean since about uh, 1970 has been constant if, 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 in fact, it hasn't gone down some. So the fact of the matter is all of the growth in our system over the last 35 years has been taken up in water reclamation plants, which uh, makes, as I said, good economic sense, good environmental sense. And then the amount of material being discharged to the ocean has gone down substantially, which, again, makes for good environmental sense. However, this material has to go somewhere, and if it doesn't go to the ocean, then it's got to be recycled on land. The one thing that's, uh, that's axiomatic in our business uh, is it doesn't disappear. And, and you, there's no free lunch, no and you gotta find matter. a way to do it. It's physics, no destruction of matter. No destruction of matter. You can change form, but there's no destruction of it. Let's go to the next one real quick, please. Uh, that's the quality of the water that comes out of our water reclamation plants. That's not the quality, that's, not, that's water not being wasted to the ocean, but this is water actually being reused, and it, it, it meets uh, uh, essentially all drinking water standards and is uh, essentially virus free. Go to the next one. But yet we don't drink it. No, you don't drink it. And the, the, um, I'll put it this way, doctor. Um, that, that what was, what's in that beaker uh, is as higher quality of a lot of the water supplies along the Mississippi River. But still, there is more of a psychological barrier. Um, health services would say that I'm wrong in stating that, that is more than psychological, where people don't want to see it in their, in their drinking water supply directly. But that's okay, because there's an awful lot of uses that it, that it can be put to where it replaces 
freshwater supplies now or places where fresh water is being used, for example, on the irrigation of parks or in golf courses. There's over 500 sites that we have uh, in conjunction with uh, water supply agencies, water distribution agencies that are being used in Los Angeles County uh, where this water, this high quality water is being used. Go to the next one. Get through these quicker. This is just a pie diagram that gives you an idea of the amount of reclaimed water uh, that is being used in Los Angeles County for the last uh, fiscal, well, fiscal year, a year ago, 2003-2004. Uh, 72,000 acre feet of water is actually being reused. Now that's the water supply of a population of about 350,000 people in rough numbers. That is a big community. So water reclamation is making a significant contribution as an alternative supply uh, and, and it's not that we can't do a lot more. Uh, before Ron left and we were talking about a lot of things that can be used to broaden our horizons and increase the amount of water. Uh, the, by far, the, the majority of it, 50% of it, is in groundwater recharge. You allow this water to pond in, in uh, sandy areas in the San Gabriel Rio Hondo River and then it gets further natural treatment and goes down through the soil and then augments the groundwater supply. Uh, and, and then the rest of it is being used in these other, uh, other areas, landscape, agricultural, industrial, and environmental is like in wetlands. So let's go to the next one quickly. Now, I want to turn to garbage. That just a quick summary on wastewater where you serve five and a half million people and have this environmental ethic of, uh, of, uh, of producing this, this high quality water. And there's a lot more to the whole system and the engineering of it and the the politics of it, but that gives you, I think, just a broad brush flavor for it. In Los Angeles County, besides producing sewage, we produce garbage. Uh, and in all of Los Angeles County, right now, there's about 78, almost 80,000 tons a day uh, of garbage, okay? Uh, that's a tremendous amount of refuse, but there's a lot of people, almost 11 million people. Uh, the good news is, uh, about half of it, 50 percent, a little over 50 percent of it, is actually being recycled. And that's the highest percentage in the United States for any state that, that I'm aware of. Uh, and and uh, it, a lot of that is because of, uh, of laws that have been in, enacted by the legislature. A lot of discussion going on as to whether in, uh, recycling is cost effective, but the fact of the matter is it's keeping it out of, of landfills because the, the majority of the refuse disposed of in Los Angeles County goes to landfills. This is just a truck going into one of our sites, one of the largest sites in the United States. Go to the next slide, quick. Uh, this is where all of our sites are operated. I showed you a map before that showed all of the water reclamation plants and our treatment plants. And this is a, uh, where all of our sites are in Los Angeles County for landfills, refuse to energy facilities, trash burn plants. There's not a lot of those in LA County because of the concern for air quality, but yet these plants uh, produce uh, an alternative source of energy, and that's really important for us. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is an aerial of, of uh, some people would refer to it to a dump, as, as a dump, but it's a, it's a modern metropolitan landfill. It's not a dump because it, it recovers all of the gas that goes in. There's a tremendous amount of recycling that goes on at, at modern metropolitan landfills. Uh, there, there is not leachate or groundwater pollution because the site, uh, the more newer portions of the site are lined, but there's a lot of technology that goes into developing and uh, operating these sites such that they are they're, they're very much uh, environmentally uh, sound and sensitive. And you can see the kind of contouring that's been done uh, to make it as, uh, as attractive as possible for people passing by. This is the Pomona Freeway here out near the 605. That's a the, the uh, cemetery in the, uh, in the back, Rose Hill Cemetery in the back, and the Hacienda Heights community on the left. Let's go to the next one, please. Um, we just have completed the, uh, the construction and the final throws of the construction of a, put, of a materials recovery facility. And this is a facility where when uh, the landfill, when the trucks come into the landfill, if the truck is laden with a lot of recyclables like cardboards, things like that, then you would divert it to this facility and it'll be processed such that those recyclables will be recovered. The, the material that can't be 
recovered is sent back to the landfill. Let's go to the next slide. So that's the artist's rendering. And then the next one is the facility itself, just about completed, $35 million. It's a huge building, 200,000 square feet under roof uh, that will handle about uh, a great deal of refuse, 4,000 tons a day of refuse. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is uh, the last one that I have because you need to think about the fact that when I showed you this landfill, um, it has a finite life. Uh, some people would say, well, you shouldn't be filling canyons, but the fact of the matter is it's a, it really is a, a, an environmentally sensitive, cost-effective way to be able to handle refuse. But what are you going to do when we run out of space in L.A. County, and we're approaching that now? Well, we've embarked upon implementing a system that's going to take refuse from Los Angeles County by rail to Imperial County. And the landfill has been permitted, so it's going to go in containers, in closed containers, on a train, 200 miles to the south, and a landfill will be built in a remote part of, uh, of Imperial County. It's a massive, uh, massive undertaking in the construction of the infrastructure. And there will still be a tremendous amount of recycling that goes on before the material is ever put in a train. So as I'm sure that, that Ron and Dominic are going to talk to you about on, on the water supply end of it, uh, it's, it's, not just, it's not just cost effectiveness, but it's a sensitivity to the environment within, uh, within the existing political structure that brings about uh, the, the management of these systems. And in Los Angeles County, uh, including the city of Los Angeles, I think you'll find that it's one of the most advanced systems in the, in the United States, if not the world. So we're going to ask you a lot about the politics of all of this in a second after we uh, get uh, Ron and Dominic to uh, comment about the so, Ron, please, about the Metropolitan Water District. And, and why, did, why did you leave? <laughs> why did I leave? <laughs> well, I'll get to that. I want that. Um, I started uh, at Whittier College. I graduated from Whittier College. I had a um, double major in um, political science and economics. Went on to uh, UCLA Law School, where I attended law school with Dominic. So we've been good friends since that time. Um, and. Um, really got in the water business. Uh, once I had spent some time in the central California area, I was working uh, for farm workers, actually. Um, and it became very apparent to me that water um, is one of the, along with energy. Uh, without water, without energy, without our key essentials, this state has no economy. So I became fascinated with water, and I was pointed to the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, where I began working early in my career. <laughs> Um, what is the Metropolitan Water District? I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Metropolitan is. I'm going to tell you what I think our water supply is here in Southern California, our outlook of water supply, if you will. And then I'm going to give you a brief commentary on politics or governance and how it relates to key decisions that have been made and will be made on our water supply in Southern California. The Metropolitan Water District of Southern California was formed in uh, the 1930 or thereabouts, when it was, became clear to the city of Los Angeles and 12 other cities that Southern California was going to grow and our existing water supplies was simply not going to meet that growth. So they looked to the Colorado River and they designed an aqueduct system that brings water from the Colorado River all the way to here in uh, urban Southern California. They built this aqueduct about 242 miles. That has been the backbone of Metropolitan's water supply as the supplemental water supplier for our region. Today, that, that supply is still intact, and we've added supplies from what is called the State Water Project. Uh, back when Governor Pat Brown was in charge of this state, he championed the development of the State Water Project, which brings water from north of the Sacramento San Joaquin <coughs> Delta, Lake Oroville, through the Delta, and through various pipes and facilities to Central California and Southern California. So we import, through those two main sources, about 60% of the water that is consumed in urban Southern California. Ventura County, Los Angeles County, Orange County, San Diego County, Riverside County, and parts of San Bernardino, the Metropolitan Water District, a public agency, serves about 18 million people um, every year, about 60% of the water that's consumed. So it's a big, big player. The Metropolitan Water District's governance is 
a 37 member board of directors. There are 26 member public agencies. The city of Los Angeles, one of the founding members, um, is a, a, continues to be a member today, and they appoint representatives to our board. They're appointed. That's a key uh, point I'm gonna make in, in, as I talk about our politics. So our board comes together, they make the key decisions about water supply, investment, water rates, those kinds of things. Um, it is a special district, um, but broad, broad powers in providing water for our area. So what is our water supply outlook? Um, after being at the helm of the Metropolitan Water District for almost six years, um, I have a pretty good sense, um, and I, I know it may sound optimistic and the glass is half full, but I absolutely believe there are no limits, virtually no limits on our ability to serve our population today and for the foreseeable future in urban Southern California. Why do I say that? Well, we are drawing from three watersheds. The Colorado River, yes, the Colorado River is stressed. There's tremendous growth in Las Vegas and Arizona and throughout the Colorado River Basin. But California is entitled to 4.4 million acre feet of water from the Colorado River, the lion's share of Colorado River water. The bulk of that today goes to farming in the Imperial Valley. In the urban area, we really take a relatively small share. But in the future, we have the ability to buy water from the agricultural area. We've already started doing that. Tremendous amount of water supply that is there. The amount of water that is in Northern California is again tremendous. It dwarfs even the Colorado River water supplies. We have all the plumbing in place to be able to move that water to urban Southern California. It's not easy, lots of politics, but the basic fundamentals are there. Where else do we have water? We have water in urban Southern California. There is natural runoff from the mountains, a tremendous amount today. We have really untapped sources. Jim talked about recycled water. We're just, we're just beginning to skim the surface of the potential of healthful sanitary use of reclaimed water. We have conservation. We have many ways that we can use water more smartly here in urban Southern California to stretch our supplies. And a new frontier, a fourth area of water supply is the Pacific Ocean. We absolutely know how to get that water, treat it to the highest standards, and apply it to beneficial use. And again, it's an unlimited source. Not easy, costly, tremendous politics, but the fundamentals are there if we need it to be able to do that in an environmentally responsible way. So I'm bullish on our water supply and uh, easier said than done, but we've just gone through seven years of a historic drought. And here in urban Southern California, we didn't miss a beat. Other areas were stressed, but because of our planning, our reservoir systems, our treatment plants, the tremendous investment that we've made since the early 1930s in our water supply, we're in relatively good shape. Well, on politics, um, first a, an observation on infrastructure. I've been in the waste management industry. I've been in the water industry. I'm about to go into the energy business. Um, and there are similarities across the board in how you deal with infrastructure. Clearly, politics is a big part of it. Finance, how you finance these major capital investments and do the O&M on a regular basis to keep them up. Huge, huge challenge. Engineering, you need really top flight engineers to apply their skills and the latest technologies to be able to maintain and build these infrastructure uh, systems. And finally, public relations. There's a huge disconnect between the public, the average citizen, and what it really takes to build and maintain infrastructure. And we're constantly struggling with politicians who uh, will take on reclaimed water, for example, because they are playing to the worst fears of the public when, in fact, it is a tremendous resource that could be available to us. Our job is to try and overcome that and deal with it. Public relations is a big part of what we do in infrastructure management. The Metropolitan Water District has been successful because some really smart people figured out how to spread the cost of major infrastructure over large areas. So we use the tax base. 
we're entitled to use a small piece of the tax base. It's now dwindling, but it used to be more, to be able to make these major investments. When we sell water to 18 million people, you can imagine the revenues are tremendous and it allows us the opportunity to leverage those sales, issue bonds, and again, finance huge works. We just built a reservoir out in Hemet, a $2 billion investment that we are paying for today and we're gonna continue to pay for, but in the drought, it really was our saving grace. And more, more works are, are on the books. The rate structure at an organization like Metropolitan is critical. So having those fundamentals of a financing system, having a rate structure that reflects your costs, and a board of directors that is applying business principles, finance principles, and I would argue to you, not running for election. Running for election is a very, very difficult thing to do, and at the same time, make these hard decisions that these appointed officials have to make to make these long-term investments. They're not getting a return tomorrow. They're looking for return for the next 25 and 50 years. So fundamentals are appointed, basic rate structure that has integrity, and public officials who come to the table ready to make the hard decisions. Then we as managers, using our engineers, using our political public relations, have the opportunity to build the kind of systems that we have here and enjoy, like the Metropolitan Water District. Thank you. Thanks. Dominic. I'm last, and uh, we were first. Uh, <laughs> Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has been around a long time. Uh, it was uh, formally founded in uh, 1902, but uh, had uh, underpinnings uh, going back to the founding of the Pueblo here in Los Angeles. The uh, Pueblo was, as you know, founded in the 1770s, um, and the source of water for the city at that point was the Los Angeles River. Uh, the most important person in the Pueblo for the longest period of time uh, was the San Hedo. The San Hedo was the head ditch digger who uh, controlled the flow of water into the city, the distribution of the water, the allocation of the water. And uh, for the longest time, uh, the San Hedos uh, made more money than the city council members and the mayor. And uh, they were more important. And we, um, we have that as, uh, as the history and legacy of, uh, of DWP. In the 1862 era, the uh, leadership of the city uh, was stressed for money, didn't have uh, the resources um, able to sustain the department, and so they privatized it. And a lot of people don't realize that, that there was a private company that was in charge of all of the water supply for the city of Los Angeles. That was the Los Angeles Water Company, and it was in existence from um, 1862 to 1902, and was the predecessor uh, to the Department of Water and Power. Uh, there were a number of people that recognized, as Ron mentioned, that uh, Los Angeles was never going to reach its potential, was never going to grow, and be able to accommodate uh, projected growth that was in the future without that water supply being in public hands. Uh, there was litigation throughout the uh, 1890s that culminated in a lawsuit uh, that resulted in the sale of that private water company back to the city in 1902. Uh, DWP is, uh, was formed. Uh, it was a Department of Water at the time. Power came a little later, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and uh, our governance is uh, significantly simpler than my two predecessors uh, this evening. Uh, DWP serves only the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we supply the water and the power within the city boundaries of the city of Los Angeles. We don't go outside the city, um, except on some rare uh, circumstances uh, in terms of supplying water or power. We, uh, we are uh, a creature of the city charter. Uh, the city charter uh, specifically designates the existence of the department, how we function, and our governance. Uh, we are comprised of a board of uh, of commissioners. There are five of us that are appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the city council. We uh, serve for five-year terms, and uh, we are the 
basically the board of directors for the Department of Water and Power. We have um, able managers, a general manager, assistant general managers that, uh, that run the department. Uh, Ron is very interesting in that he was uh, uh, shy and didn't tell you that prior to the time that he became the general manager of the Met, he was a board member of the Met. So uh, very unusual. But representing the city of Los Angeles. Representing the city of Los Angeles. And uh, actually, Ron and I were appointed at the same time, uh, the same day. He was appointed to the Met Board. I was appointed to the, appointed to the DWP Board. Um, and it's sort of, it is odd because we were classmates in law school back in the 60s. So uh, the DWP uh, is the largest municipally owned uh, utility in the United States. We have uh, 8,100 employees. At one time, we had as many as approaching 13,000 employees. Uh, it is a huge, huge company. And uh, as I said, we supply all of the water to the city of Los Angeles, as well as all of the power to the city of Los Angeles. The, uh, the development of the infrastructure, and this is what your class is about, uh, and the history of the department are completely intertwined. DWP sits here today because of infrastructure investments that were made by our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Uh, we are sitting on the shoulders of giants. Uh, there are people in the history of the DWP in the city of Los Angeles that had a vision that's very difficult to explain, and at times I wonder where their um, inspiration came from. But they clearly understood that for, for Los Angeles to meet its um, potential and to fulfill its obligations to you and, and to your children, I had uh, decisions had to be made a long time ago, and the city was willing to tax itself, and the city was willing to commit itself. Uh, a perfect example was, was Los Angeles uh, Aqueduct, which is a uh, major source of water from the Eastern Sierra, a watershed that Ron did not mention. Uh, that aqueduct was built in the, uh, the uh, late uh, 1900s to 1912, and uh, at the time that it was built, it represented 100% of the bonding capacity of the entire city. The entire bonding capacity of the city was pledged for the creation of that aqueduct. And today, we are getting the benefits of that. Ron talked about the water coming from the Met. We are members of the Met. We were founders of the Met. William Mulholland, the founder of, of the Department of Water and Power, was the founder of the Met. Uh, but to give you an idea of the value of, um, of what that means and what it means today, that infrastructure investment that was made almost 100 years ago, uh, when we get water from the Eastern Sierra, it comes to us uh, through the aqueduct that I described. It comes into, uh, into the Silmar area where the 5 and the 14 freeway meet. There's a couple of uh, uh, treatment facilities there. There's the Met facility, uh, the Jensen facility, and our, uh, our facility there. Uh, and when the water gets there from the Eastern Sierra, it probably costs us $100, $100 an acre foot. And that may, may not mean a lot to you, but when we go to Ron and we buy water from the Met, it costs pretty close to $400 an acre foot. Four fifty-one. There you are. Okay, the man knows exactly what he's selling for. So that price differential is the differential between an infrastructure investment that took place 100 years ago, that's gonna be there 100 years from now. Uh, it, it is a phenomenal gift. That gift has basically subsidized growth in the city of Los Angeles. It has subsidized business. It has sub subsidized schools, universities. It has, um, it has led to the creation of wealth in Los Angeles that would not have been possible but for those investments. The interesting thing about that aqueduct uh, and the elegant element of that aqueduct was that Mulholland not only had the vision for the existence of the need, he not only had the vision for the, um, the, the uh, seeing where that need could be solved, how it could be solved, but he came up with a system that is just phenomenal. The, from the uh, intake, uh, the uh, Levining intake in uh, uh, just uh, west of uh, Mammoth to Los Angeles in San Pedro, uh, uh, that distance is 330 miles. And that is one long aqueduct, one impressive infrastructure investment. 
And in designing it and in building it, he went beyond. And what he did is he realized that, that from that distance to here, it's all downhill. So uh, understanding and being a good engineer, as Ron alluded to earlier, uh, he understood that there were opportunities there. And one of the opportunities was the creation of power. So the gravity flow of the water was harnessed through a series of power plants that still exist today that supply power to the city of Los Angeles that help reduce the cost of delivering that water. And it's a win-win situation. Ultimately, uh, the same um, uh, philosophy of municipal ownership of water uh, systems led to the um, involvement of the DWP into the power side and up until 1939, there were multiple power providers, Edison, other private companies providing power within the city of LA. In, 18, in 1939, uh, those, uh, those companies were bought out. We bought them out. We consolidated it. And uh, since that time, we have been the sole supplier of power to the, uh, to the city. Uh, our power comes uh, from uh, local power plants that we have within the, uh, the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, it comes from a variety of different sources uh, and types. Um, we are reflective of the society th that we live in. At one time, uh, our power plants were uh, exclusively coal uh, burning. Uh, we have uh, power plants in Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and uh, we have a, a wide range now, uh, a, a balanced portfolio, if you will. Uh, we are able to meet all of our uh, demands for power. Uh, some of you can remember back four or five years ago when we had the energy crisis uh, created by elected politicians that Ron had alluded to. Um, uh, was it Mr. Peace from San Diego? I, I don't want to point fingers, but. I think they all voted for it. Yeah, everyone in the, in the, uh, in the Senate and the Assembly, uh, I believe, uh, voted for it. Uh, I don't believe there was a single abstention. And the net result of that is they were trying to solve problems on a political basis uh, that really didn't lend themselves to a political solution, created this great energy crisis. And when that hit, there were no negative consequences within the city of Los Angeles because of the infrastructure investment that had taken place 50 years ago. So there were no, 40 no, years black, ago. no blackouts? No blackouts. When's the last time LA's had a blackout? I it would it would probably I was born I was born I was born in World War One or World War Two. Well, I was born in 1944, and I don't remember in my lifetime any of them. I really don't. I do not remember uh, a single blackout. So all of that comes from infrastructure investment, and the the interesting thing that I tell my colleagues on my board, and I tell people that are interested in infrastructure, is that we are not being judged. None of the three of us here are being judged by what we're doing today. We can do things today and it'll come and go and it'll be covered in the paper and it'll be gone. The way in which we will be judged is five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and 40 years from now when you are our age and the city still works, there's still water, the lights are still on, and, and that your children will be in college and the system will continue to work. That's when we will be measured. That's how we should be measured, I believe. Uh, in opposite of elected officials who have term limits, who are, are looking at their next political seat. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to beat up on them, but, but it is uh, important. So you're against uh, uh, popular democracy for the election of decision makers? Well, <laughs> on boards such as this, I think the progressive era uh, thought a lot about that. And I think they, they, develop, they developed the concept of separation of powers uh, even farther than the form framers of the Constitution, where you had, of course, the legislative, the, uh, the executive, and the uh, judicial branch. And the decision that was made in the city of Los Angeles was a creation of citizen commissions. Uh, these commissions functioned very well today. And in the late uh, 1990s, when the charter was being re revised and uh, updated and changed, one of the major considerations was whether or not commissions were still vital and whether they still um, uh, functioned. And uh, I believe they do. I'm a strong proponent of that. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve on a number of different commissions for the city, and I've seen them work. And um, yes, Fernando, I am not in favor of elected commissioners. So that, that's, 
But that, that does not surprise people in terms of the DWP. When you think about the history of the DWP, you think about the movie Chinatown. It's an old movie, but you know, just starring Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunaway, etc. And uh, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but there were like it kind of implied some shady aspects of how the DWP was able to get water, etc. Is that is that what happened? Well, I know you weren't around at that time. Well, I will tell you this: I've actually had the opportunity to lecture with Robert Town on the uh, the difference between the fictionalized uh, Chinatown series oh, well, story. Town is, was Robert Town was a screenwriter. Yeah who wrote uh, Chinatown. And in the year uh, 1974, when The Godfather won every Academy Award, Robert Town won the screen best screenplay for Chinatown. Uh, and that was pretty impressive given the, what happened that year with The, with the Godfather. But Robert and I have, uh, have actually, we've lectured in cinema classes together on the gap between the fictionalization of Chinatown and the reality. But what's interesting is, is uh, in Chinatown, <coughs> There were, there were two polemics that were, were the good and evil that were personified by Noah Cross and Hollis Mulray. Now, obviously, Mulray was a takeoff on Mulholland, and what uh, people don't know is that, um, that uh, uh, um, Noah Cross, the villain, was the so-called so uh, distillation of uh, Fred Eaton, and it was the conflict between, the actual historic conflict between Fred Eaton and William Mulholland with regards to their beliefs as to who should own the water supply that led to some of the greatest uh, um, conflicts in the movie. And yes, there is, a, there is a, a colorful history of DWP. And what Fernando is alluding to was uh, at the time that the aqueduct was built, uh, as you may know, the aqueduct pretty much follows uh, Highway uh, 395 Highway 14 and then 395 up, uh, up into uh, Mono uh, County, up to Mammoth. And those lands up there did not belong to DWP. And if you don't own the land, you don't own the water supply under California law. And uh, there's other subtleties to it, but, but generally what happened was Los Angeles realized that it needed more water. It looked at other available water supplies at the time, and that was prior to the time that Mulholland thought about bringing the water in from uh, the Colorado River. And the thought was that to do so, you have to own the land. And if you go out and you buy land at market value, and you're a continued buyer of land at market value, you create the market, and what happens is the value of real estate will sky, skyrocket. And what Fernando is alluding to is that the city of Los Angeles used surrogates, used um, uh, privacy. Now, some would use other words, uh, including a, a young man who once worked for Ron, who uh, his name will not go mentioned. But uh, uh, we went up and we, we bought the land from the farmers and the people that own the land up in the Owens Valley. Not telling them that you were going to buy it to take the water down to Southern California. Absolutely. Uh, we, d we, 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 uh, we dealt with them at arm's length uh, in a commercial uh, transaction. We bought it many times above market. Uh, we, we, we bought it when it became available. We did not have eminent domain. We had no capacity to take it from them. So it was totally their choice. And in many instances, what we did is we bought it from families, paid them uh, the value of the land, and then turned right around and leased the land back to them and some of our leases in the Owens Valley today have been our leases for 100 years. So uh, their families are still using the land. So. so, I mean, but you know, people talk about the DWP. Remember, it's a city agency, and they call it, a, you know, it's pretty it's expansionistic, imperialistic in the minds of many because they own property, as you mentioned earlier, in Arizona, Nevada, Utah. They own property throughout all of uh, the Sierra Nevadas. I mean, that's very unusual for a city to own we're, property throughout the whole West. We're the only city agency. That, uh, that has those assets outside the city boundaries. We had uh, Richard Alarcon here last week. Yes. And then maybe of you, many of you have probably seen his commercial where he's punching he a bag. He sued us. Well, exactly. That's what I was going to ask. He, he talked about the DWP, and one of the reasons he's running for mayor is because this unresponsive, imperialistic, expansionistic agency, unrepresented without uh, elected officials on the commission, raised the rates without doing it Properly, so he got mad and he sued. And that, that's according to his opinion. Yeah, he's and smarter he, than that. He knows what really went on. Uh -huh. 
the city of Los Angeles City Council has been raiding the treasury of DWP for years, and because they couldn't raise rates mm -hmm. without the city's approval, they got in a bit of a pickle. When they needed to raise rates, and at the same time the city council was expecting this subsidy, the public was sort of shocked, I think, at the whole thing. And Mr. Alarcon is taking advantage of, uh, well, of that situation. Well, why, why would a politician do that? Because he's running for office. I well, I, I, I was, uh, I was uh, asked uh, by the newspapers to comment on Mr. Alarcon uh, when he first brought up the, uh, the issue of a state audit of DWP and the validity of the transfer of surplus funds from DWP to the general funds of the city of Los Angeles. And I believe the language or my terminology in describing him and his actions were scumbag opportunist. Oh. Uh, the newspaper. <laughs> this this, is, being, this is being televised. <laughs> That's fine. That. No, no, scumbag opportunist. <laughs> and I asked the newspaper to publish that, and they refused to publish it. Now, if Mr. Alarcon were right here, I would use those exact words again. And I believe I said scumbag opportunist. <laughs> So if the record this isn't is clear. This is a City of LA TV station, so if he becomes mayor, we're going to be in trouble. I'm going to go back. <laughs> no, no, I'll be in trouble because I'll be an ex-commissioner. Uh -huh. But that's okay because the reason why I have that opinion was because when the City of Los Angeles uh, modified its charter in 1924, the charter provided for the Department of Water and Power to create a rate structure to pay for its cost, its operation, its maintenance, investments into the future, and if there was surplus, that that surplus could be transferred to the general fund. Now, political, political, political opportunists will say that that's stealing from the citizens of Los Angeles. But you were listening to me earlier when I told you that we only serve the city of Los Angeles. So, to describe to you what Mr. Alicon is objecting to is the following. <coughs> Money out of DWP that is surplus funds is taken out of this pocket because it is given there by the ratepayers, right? And that money is sneakily taken out of this pocket and brought and put into this pocket. <coughs> the citizens, there is not one gap of difference between a citizen in the city of Los Angeles and a ratepayer. So if it bothers you that the money that you have in this pocket should be in this pocket, and Mr. Alicon, who served on the city council for eight years and accepted that money himself, was not offended by that at that time. Uh, you can see where I have the formulation of my opinion. Who are you voting for mayor? Uh, it is not Mr. Alicon. <laughs> by the way, we have, we have made that transfer since the 1920s. Before Mr. Alicon was born, the matter has been litigated, and the matter has been approved and authorized by the courts. Mr. Alarcon uh, served for many years as an aide to Mayor Bradley, never once raised the issue, never once was concerned about that when the money came from DWP to fund all of the activities that transpired in the city. When he was elected to the city council, he did not once object to this or to getting the money having to transfer from one yeah, pocket. Going back to the question, though, why are we increasing rates if we have a surplus? Well, it, it, the surplus is, is, a, <laughs> is a, um, uh, a mixture of, of a number of factors um, that... And you're starting to sound like a politician now. No, I, <laughs> no. It, uh, the surplus... The surplus See, look at that. Any, any time someone talks, like, it has to do that little stutter. That means they're trying to uh, come up with a, a, a cute answer. You should have voted with it more often, Dominic. Uh, <laughs> no, no go ahead. Go ahead with your answer. Yeah, the sorry surplus, for the, the surplus is a creation of a number of things. The surplus does not mean that we are debt free. The surplus does not mean that we are without um, um, long term debts, bonds, as Ron mentioned, or other kinds. It means that we have an operating service surplus on that given year for that year of operation. Now, the reason we have a rate increase is that we have a number of different mandates that have been imposed upon DWP that have come from the federal government and from the state government with regards to the quality of water that we serve to you. Uh, uh, James uh, just mentioned earlier about the caliber of water 
that was in that retreat, re, uh, recycled um, uh, water. Absolutely correct. That's probably better water than 90% of the people in the United States are getting. But because of, of changing scientific capacities, there are greater uh, abilities to measure, hence greater standards. And so we have now a shifting um, uh, standards of water quality that we have to deliver. Those mandates, in many, many instances, I can't think of a single one that's an exception to this, come unfunded, which means we don't, we don't uh, get money from the feds to pay for this. So if they say that this water has to have zero parts per trillion of arsenic, and we know that hot springs in the eastern Sierra creates a little bit of arsenic, then we have four parts per trillion, of which it has no health impact, but because of this mandate, we have to take it out, and we have to take our treatment facility in Silmar, redo it, have new technologies uh, applied to it. It's going to cost about $360 million to do so. So we, many times, are, are being pushed uh, by politicians to meet standards that have very little to do with actual health uh, uh, requirements. Uh, it is a little frustrating at times, particularly when those mandates come unfunded and, uh, and we have to uh, pay for those. We meaning you, and we meaning the, the poorest people in Los Angeles have to pay for it, but that's part of the deal. Now, in 1992, okay, 1992 was the last time we had a water rate increase in the city of Los Angeles. It happened at that time to be 11% by coincidence. Um, and I have all of the clippings and all the news stories by city council and the mayor, and everybody was all upset at the time. And it's funny because if you read that in 1992 and you change the dates, it's exactly the same story. What are the water rates in LA? Are they higher or lower than the ones in like San Diego? Or I mean, how, how do we average that? They're out? lower. We're significantly lower, particularly we're significantly lower than the member agencies of the Met who are 100% reliant upon Ron's water. And you, of course, know that because he told you that water from him is $441 an acre foot. And I just told you we get a lot of the water for $125 an acre foot. So we create blended rates. We have various uh, sources of water, including the Met. Uh, we're able to provide water significantly cheaper than our competitors. Uh, uh, one, one last question. These two gentlemen next to me are basically the CEOs of their corporation. They are the top guys. You are on the board of directors that then selects the top guy. So you get paid what? Oh, I get paid exactly what I'm worth, Fernando. Zero. Right. <laughs> he doesn't get paid a, paid Zero. a That's why Ron gave up being a board member to become the general manager where he made this huge income on the public trough. I'm not dumb. I'm not well, dumb. Talk to you, what are you paying right now? Your your general manager. What does he get paid? Our general manager is getting paid about three hundred twelve, three hundred thirteen thousand dollars a year. You started out earlier that the Sanjero got paid the highest, more than the mayor. Well, that, that's much more than the mayor or any other. He's the highest paid city <coughs> official. And and I think he's the highest paid um, public official in the state of California, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. He makes uh, more than anyone at the airport. He makes more than the sheriff, um, and he's worth every penny of it. He's a bargain not unusual to have so you can make some money being in public administration we won't ask these gentlemen what they're what they're making that but, uh, that's that's a good middle class income um, continuing with the w continuing with the uh, mayor's race uh, James uh, all five of the major candidates have uh, are against the uh, Sunshine uh, Canyon landfill um, and, and when, when we earlier had this theme about they're not really investing for the future. Uh, can we close Sunshine Canyon down like some electeds would want us to do tomorrow? Can you close it? Sure, you can close it. And what would happen? Is it, is it the responsible decision to close it? Um, in, in my opinion, um, as an engineer and a manager, no. I think it is. Describe Sunshine Canyon for them a little bit and where well, it Sunshine is. Sunshine Canyon is a landfill um, operated by uh, the private sector. Uh, in the uh, northern uh, end of the San Fernando Valley. But near you know, our two treatment plants. Yeah. That's right. But if you know where the intersection of the 5 and the 14 is, it's just on the western side. Um, and it is uh, a, modern, uh, a modern landfill. 
and I, I think that uh, that it it's environmentally sound. Uh, I, I mean, I take a great deal of pride in the fact that I don't think that it is as good a site as we have at Pointy Hills, but, I mean, you know, there's always pride in your own company, in so your own your organization. But uh, Your members don't take trash up there? Uh, they do not. This, the, this, some, I shouldn't say that. Some of our cities take trash up there through transfer stations. Uh, and let me back off. Uh, let, me, let me answer your question, then I want to add to why our cities, uh, uh, some take trash up there and some don't. Um, the, the, uh, the Sunshine Canyon landfill um, provides the city of Los Angeles with very cost-effective uh, refuse disposal. And if you were to shut that landfill down, and I'm not favoring one candidate or another, but well, these are five, the facts. All five are against okay, it. So but it's, but yeah. what I'm saying is if you were to shut that down, then those trucks <coughs> are going to have to go to more distant sites. And there will be more uh, traffic. There will be more air pollution from that standpoint, even though they were talking about consolidating the loads and taking it to another area, aha, outside of the city of Los Angeles. So if you've ever heard of NIMBYs, uh, not in my backyard. So it's OK to close a, a well-operating facility within your jurisdiction, but you still have to get rid of the refuse. You still have to provide an outlet. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to take it someplace else. And then somebody can be against closing that site. Uh, so I, I think that it's what, what Dominic was saying, what Ron was saying, is that you need uh, commissioners or you need appointed boards in the infrastructure business that act in, in the, the, better, for the betterment of the whole. Now, there might be one particular area of a given jurisdiction or a city that wants to see a facility shut down. That doesn't, shutting that facility down isn't necessarily the best decision for the whole. And that's the success of the Water and Power, of the Department of Water and Power, because I, I believe that they've always made the decisions for the betterment of the whole, not one particular group. Certainly Metropolitan in serving 18 million people have, have done that. And in serving uh, 78 of the 88 cities in LA County, and you have the mayors on, uh, the, my bosses in essence, sitting on a board of directors, they make, and they rarely have anything other than a unanimous decision, even though the arguments and the benefits, pros and cons are fully vetted, because they're sitting there wanting to do not what's best for the short term, but for the short term and the long term. They're not, in essence, making a decision because I'm going to have to run for office tomorrow on that decision. <laughs> but they're making it as uh, elected citizens, because on, on my board, they're mayors. But they're not running on a platform to get elected to the board of the sanitation districts. That is the local issue for them. So when they sit there, they sit there as really intelligent people from the community that makes a decision that's best for the community. So when you get back to Sunshine Canyon, I, I would say that any time you're going to close down any facility, water treatment, wastewater treatment, or solid waste management, and you're not going to close down a water treatment plant because you've got pipes coming in there. You're not going to close down a wastewater treatment plant because there's pipes coming in there. But it's really easy to close down a landfill because it comes in by truck. You let the truck drive someplace else. So the mobility associated with refuse management leads to some very difficult uh, uh, political decisions that people take, in my opinion, the easy way out and just shut it down. Yeah. In, in talking about the easy way, if, if uh, all of the trash that goes to Sunshine were to go to Eagle Mountain or any of the alternative sites available, what would be the economic impact on the city of Los Angeles? Well, it would be tremendous, Dominic. I think you know the numbers. I think you pay somewhere around all, say, $24 a ton of refuse right now. It, it used to be 21 and I think re recently you're paying $24 a ton. Um, if you were to have to haul it, ultimately, uh, to, to, say, one of our waste-by-rail sites, uh, in today's dollars, it would cost you about $60 a ton. So three but, times. Uh, so but the city of New York pays 100 150 So even the 60 is a bargain. But the point is, now where is that money going to come from? that additional money 
for all of the other pressure points within the city of LA. And I, and I don't want to pick on the city of LA. I'm saying that Good example. I, I'm saying that for any local government. There has to be this this balance uh, in societal uh, society's needs. A certain amount's going to be on education, police, fire, and, and if in the infrastructure business, if you decide today that uh, I'm going to raid the money that's set aside for water infrastructure. Why? Because I got to get by this election. So I'm going to raid that money out of there and I'm going to put it over here for fire police. That's going to come back to haunt you because someday you're going to have to improve that infrastructure. And then at that point in time, you get yourself into a bind and you go out and you sell huge bonds and you pay a tremendous amount of interest on those bonds and you wind up paying a lot more than you would have if you would have made the reasoned decision in the beginning. Yeah, let me ask Ron a question, then I'm going to open it up to the students to ask questions. Um, I mean, it's been a constant theme of this panel, but also every single week, with the exception of when the elected officials were here. But even <laughs> then, it, it's that no one wants it next to them. We're talking about infrastructure, okay? Three things. No one wants it next to them, no one wants to pay for it, and no one wants to plan for it. That's been a co constant theme. The MWD is, of the three agencies really has been something, someone that's built something lately. You mentioned the, the, uh, that, that uh, reservoir out in Hemet, $2 billion. How in the heck did you, were you able to cite it, pay for it, and plan for it? How did that come about? Well, $2 as, billion. A, a, as I said, the board of directors is somewhat removed from local politics. Um, we have the financial ability without raising rates significantly, so they were politically secure in looking at this, the engineers came to the table and said, we can do this. Um, I think some very creative people in the planning process said, we need to try and approach this a different way. We know there are people out there that don't want new infrastructure. What can we do for that community? So we created a preserve, a natural preserve that is twice the size of the reservoir. And it was very, very popular with the local community. We're now in the throes of deciding how much recreation we're going to add. So it, it was, it was uh, involving the community. It was some bargaining process. Um, and, and admittedly, a, a reservoir is a lot easier to sell than a landfill. Yeah, but it's very different than what we talked about historically, what the DWP did up in the, uh, the Eastern Sierra in terms of what you just did in terms of involving the community. You cannot build things uh, without involving the community anymore. Well, I think that, that's exactly right, although in, in defense of Mulholland and his time, they probably did more than most people did by paying fair value and, and, and going overboard and trying to pay for what they were getting. That was probably pretty extreme for pretty the time. Back then. Right, but we've oh, just yeah. learned over time that you have to do more, and that's what we're doing. Any questions out there? No questions? Can I, can I make a statement about infrastructure? We got, we got, yeah, we'll make the statement, then we'll get your question right over the, here. Yeah. The, the statement I wanted to make about no one wanting it near them is something that, that politicians have real trouble with. And, and people like the three of us, I think, have a lot less trouble with because we're not elected officials. And it's this. All, as you said, Fernando, all of us want the benefit of all of these infrastructures. All of us want the benefit of having the harbor here because we can get all of the goods that come from Asia that are produced here cheaply and we are the, the beneficiaries of that and we have an enhanced lifestyle at a lower price because of the, of the harbor. All of us want the airport. I mean, the minute one of you guys gets a free ticket to go to the Super Bowl, I mean, you know, you'd be really unhappy if you had to go to San Francisco for an airport. You know, you want that airport, you want to be able to use that airport it creates commerce, it facilitates um, the way we live. Landfills, treatment plants, uh, power plants, all are necessary and vital for an organic living entity that we call municipalities, cities, megalopolises to exist. Nobody wants them. Well, you can't have a city without those infrastructures. You can't have a functioning society without those facilities, whether it's a freeway, it's a, it's a, a subway line, it's some other kind of transportation now, facility. Well, I want them all, I just don't want them right next to me. Well, then you don't have to, you don't have to live next to them, Fernando. You, you, you get a part-time job, you make a little bit more, more money than you're making as a, as a college <laughs> professor, and you buy a lovely home in Westchester. Okay, well, no, 
Well, that's the airport's right next to me. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get away with it. You know, the 405, everything. We all, we, all, we all have a sacrifice that we all have to pay in one form or another to live with this many people together in this kind of an environment. Yeah, it's called the city. Let's get a question over here. Said um, that there's a balance between being cost effective, environmentally friendly, and then playing in the political systems to get what you need to get done. And someone else also said that you hope to be judged in five to 20 years for what you're doing. Where does your pressure come from um, as far as being cost effective, environmentally friendly, or the political system as far as how soon do you need to see results when that pressure is coming down? Let's start with uh, Ron. Well, I don't, th I don't think I said that. I, I think that, um, <laughs> bottom line, you have to be environmentally friendly in our society in order to accomplish even the short-term goals. The public demands environmental um, um, awareness and security. And right behind the public are some very effective advocates but there's uh, nothing wrong with that. I mean, we just know more, I'm not more saying about the environment. It's wrong. And we're willing to pay more for it. But that. as a manager, that's the reality I deal with. And frankly, I feel better about it. So you don't get to sacrifice the environment. And in fact, I think we have learned that when you pay attention to the environment, your investments are going to be better received by the public and probably are going to, going to be better in the long term in terms of sustainability. Yeah, way back there. In light of our uh, record-setting weather and all the catastrophes that have accompanied it, what would you suggest in terms of infrastructure improvements to better handle situations like this? I think the death toll is at nine right now. Um, what would you change? What would you do different? How can we better manage the water flow that we do get when we have too much of it? The flood control system? Well, I mean, that's not under any one of your jurisdictions, yeah, that, that, or is that? No, you? flood control yeah. comes within the county. There's a separate agency, County Flood Control, uh, that operates uh, the system along with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which help build the system. Um, is that? Yeah, that is fair to say. I, you know, the, I mean, you've got to, uh, I think all of you appreciate the fact that these are record rainfalls. Uh, there was a 15-day period uh, at the beginning of, uh, of January, where it was the most amount of rain in the 127-year record uh, of, of keeping track of rainfall uh, in Los Angeles County. Tremendous amount of rain. The topography of this area <coughs> is such that um, it runs off the mountains into a flat plain, and it just, the, 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 the call it in hydrology, time of concentration is like that, and I mean you go from you go from a trickle in the stream to a, a tremendous wall. And, and I, I personally think, even though there's been a lot of damage, uh, uh, but I think in some ways typical of the media, it, it's been simplified and exaggerated in terms of what you see on TV. Uh, I, my heart goes out to, to the people that have lost their lives. I know the city of LA lost one worker uh, in the repair of a sinkhole. And people have had homes damaged. But when you think of, just for Los Angeles County, the 10 million people that live here and the tremendous amount of rain that we got, I think it's been managed exceptionally it's an well. Incredible success is what uh, you're saying. I, I, I really think that's the case. And I think the question that you asked is, well, what can you do to manage it better? Uh, I, I'm not, I just think it's, it's been a tremendous success. But there are issues out there. And I just want to answer the one question that, Ron, you had talked about, because I was the one that had made the statement about cost-effective and environmentally sound. I don't think those have to be mutually exclusive. Ron is absolutely right. Uh, I think any organization, any organization that's going to uh, succeed has to have a strong environmental conscience. And the pressure comes from not only the, the CEO, but it, it's going to come from the elected officials because uh, people want to have uh, an, an environment that they can enjoy. But you, the, the, even though the board might want that, you've got to have the leadership and you've got to have the staff that understands that you've got to do the environmentally proper thing. But in doing that, try to do it as cost effectively as you can. And there's a lot of value judgments that come up there. It's easy for me to say, and Ron, 
Dominic, well, it's got to be environmentally sound. There's a lot of judgments as to what's environmentally <coughs> sound and how far you go and cost, and that, that's just the reality of it. Fernando, can I sure, get back to the question about the water flow on the river? One thing that a lot of people don't realize is the Los Angeles River has its origin in the Verdugos and San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, the drop in elevation from the Los Angeles River from its inception all the way down to San Pedro is greater in altitude than the drop of the Mississippi River from its origins in, in uh, uh, Minnesota all the way down to New Orleans. So we have a, a river that's extremely high um, uh, uh, differential in altitude in a very short distance, which creates all sorts of infrastructure problems. If we had Los Angeles um, as it existed in the 1850s, and we had vast open lands, a lot of open land, a lot of available land, we could create um, um, a number of different uh, catch basins, we could create uh, recharge uh, facilities, and we could do a number of different things. Many of those things are not available anymore and not doable uh, given uh, the development of what's happened in Los Angeles and the, and the conditions that we're in today. In fact, Fernando's favorite guy, Mike Davis, wrote about That's the, right. the floods, and, floods and, and troubles here in, in the city. Fernando, just yes, go one other point here. Building standards, look at your building standards. Hillsides, you've got to enforce and, and make sure that, that we're being very careful about that. But you can bet that a lot of people are going to rebuild right where those things are. Well, but that's going to take some, some real uh, discipline on the part of officials in dealing with the fact that it just may not be a place where they can say yes. Right. Um, we've got to look at our pavements. Are there places where we can replace pavement with with uh, surfaces that will allow infiltration of water and not the, the, the runoff. And, and native plants uh, are going to do a lot better in uh, holding the terrain and, uh, and are going to just be a lot more friendly in terms of falling over and creating damage. So clearly things that we can do to be better prepared. But I would agree with your assessment. We've done a tremendous amount to be successful. Let me go here and then over here and then here. Over half this campus is reclaimed water. Uh, as most of the students here know, there's like a foul odor from it. <laughs> Are you sure that's from the water? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But anyway, what is that odor? And is there anything being done about it? Or what can be done so about here's it? Here's the pessimistic okay. about, about, the, about this. That's a good question. I was also um, the irrigation mechanic for two years, so I'm familiar with it. I think. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think you ought to contact the, the city of Los Angeles, and I, I'm not, I think they, some of you So you're passing the buck to DWP? No, 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 no that's no, public works. That's public works sanitation. Okay. So they not DWP. Contact them because I, I honestly believe <coughs> they want that kind of input. Oftentimes, when you have a problem in a system, because uh, you can't go out there and check every single one, and if you have a problem in a system, unless a citizen, uh, in a meaningful way, uh, reports it, and says, hey, sometimes, well, that's what gets it corrected. My, my professional judgment is that more than likely the problem exists because there are, there are algal growths in the line. And, and oftentimes at night, algal respire, and you will get a, a swamp smell in a way. If you go near um, uh, river channels or at Bionic Creek, for example, before it was built out the way it is, and uh, you will go down there and you'll find algal respiring, and, and it, it smells. And there's a lot of nutrients in the reclaimed water. That's why the grass is green. And so that's great for the grass, but the algae also grow. And you, sometimes you get slime layers in there, and, and the, the technique is to chlorinate and flush those lines out so that you can keep them clean. And, and that's a maintenance issue. So, uh, but so if you contact them, I, I think you will. So it wouldn't happen. It, it, the, what that wouldn't happen if it was regular DWP water. It only happened. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't happen for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, our system is a closed system, and we use um, uh, chlorine as a disinfectant to uh, prevent the growth of organics in the system. The MET uses chloramines, which is uh, just a different technology, which is actually probably better. Uh, uh, since we are moving towards chloramines um, uh, to facilitate both infrastructure uh, compatibility and economics. But uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, chemicals uh, kill 
uh, all of the organics that would grow. For example, if you had a, a standing reservoir, like Stone Canyon, which supplies a lot of the west side, uh, when it was operational, uh, we would have to, even though the water had been treated prior to the time it got there, we would have to uh, come in and we would have to chlorinate, particularly uh, hot summer days uh, with a lot of sunshine, which, was, which uh, uh, facilitate the growth of, uh, of the organics. And there's chlorine, I'm sure there's chlorine. In fact, I know there's chlorine in that water. The, the question becomes, if you're near the end of the system, whether or not there enough. was enough to begin with. And so you have to make that adjustment. You, yeah, you maintain your car, you have to maintain a distribution. Do you have a follow-up? We are at the end of the system. Uh, uh, oh, we need it to record it, though. For the cameras. Uh, yeah, we're in the system, but uh, Playa Vista is actually in the system right after graduation. We've been taken off the system temporarily. We, uh, we also have a chlorinator that we just put in last year, which didn't quite help enough. But we're thinking that smell is now going to go down to Playa Vista, <laughs> and we'll be okay up here. Everyone will hear Let about them it. With, goes deal with it at the end of the line. Okay, we had a question over here in the yeah, right there in the middle. Hold, hold on one second. We need you it's just because it, it records it. I can, answer can you hear me now? There's a lot of people in LA and it keeps getting like bigger and there's even more waste production. Do you think there's going to have to be a shift in lifestyle in order to keep LA going for a longer time? Because I know the new landfills are supposed to hold for another hundred years or whatever, but with increased population, isn't there increased waste? And how do we address like lifestyle to ensure that you know companies are selling um, products that don't overuse things? You know, like if you go to McDonald's, there's so much packaging just for one meal compared to if you ate at home. There's hardly any packaging. How do we reduce waste as far as lifestyle? And how do you, as uh, I guess, as the as a, as a, as the powers that distribute um, all of this work, um, actually? encourage that or do you even encourage that because I would think the more waste the more business you get what are the plans for the future in terms of that and how can you uh, impact quality of life decisions that create uh, more more waste I mean have we, have we been effective in that area well first of all let me, let me answer the question about population I'm sure Dominic and, and, and Ron will take a shot at it but as far as population is concerned in in, in my organization in a lot of ways, not to pass the buck, but we respond to growth. When you, uh, you manage the waste from all of these cities, and it is the elected officials. So you, you really determine it at the ballot box in terms of the policies that are enacted by the people that you elect. And, and it is the elected officials uh, that make the value judgments in passing the plans as to what the community will sustain in growth. Uh, it, Ron was talking about uh, building ordinances, but there's also ordinances as far as how many homes you're going to be allowed, to, how you're going to allow to be built within a given community. And some communities are very pro-growth, some communities aren't. Uh, over and above that, I would say to you that if, if you said no more, we're going to drop the line right here, no more, uh, no more people coming into the state Especially or, from Oregon and Nevada, wherever, and like that. wherever. Yeah. Uh, the excess, the excess, the excess of birth over death is a challenging problem for us in the infrastructure. Uh, so, so it, it, it is, it is, it is before us. But I would say to you that that in the infrastructure business, there's really not much that you can do because we're not on the policy end of setting what growth ought to be nor are we on the end of determining that um, General Mills or Procter & Gamble ought to package their toothpaste this way. But you have been tremendously successful, though, in getting people to recycle. Yes. I mean, it's an incredible, but, successful but, story. So, so that has to come from the legislature, on the, on the political side of it. There has to be the will in the legislature to pass packaging laws. And then you run into issues of, of the lobbying against that, and, uh, and, and that's a whole other subject. But there was a bill passed in the state legislature called AB 939, which mandated uh, recycling for cities. They had to reach 50% by the year 2000. And for the slide that I showed you, uh, for the most part in Los Angeles County, on the average, they have done that. And there has been a great deal of, of recycling. People got used to the fact that, ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I don't want to throw my aluminum cans 
uh, into a separate can. And now it's a lifestyle. So it takes a while. And, and the commitment has to be uh, in, in the general population is through recycling. And I would dare say to you, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm looking at the future in you as to how you practice that in, in recycling and, 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 and your children practice it. Well, we put a tremendous amount into educating the public and, and, and young people about the fact that recycling makes good environmental sense. Like Palm Springs culture, yeah. And water. I mean, why would we do that if we could have zero escaping that helps and we have native plants that actually help the, you know, whatever it is to run off and all types of things, you know, natural to the environment, it would be much easier to put water. In Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley have over 300 golf courses. And they sit on one of the biggest aquifers in the world. So they have the water? No, no, they don't. Well, they, they don't. They I'm don't. sorry. They, they don't. don't. They're running out of it. They really are. I find that hard to believe. Well, it's true. Tell me about it. <laughs> it's true. Because I, well, I read, when I had, a, I used to have a place there, and they used to tell us, the Coachella Water District used to send out their, their annual report, Ron, and they would tell us about this aqueduct and how many years it would last. And well, I'm, I'm glad you believed them, but I just came out of negotiations with them where we were fighting tooth and nail over Colorado River water because oh, they, they know they need it. Oh, they want it. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think that the governmental answer to the question is agencies like us typically don't have the power to tell the public or anybody, you shall do this. So what we end up doing is educating and subsidizing. So we'll pay you. Las Vegas, for example, today is paying people to take their lawns out. So that's how they get the public to respond. Ultimately, you end up with an elected official who has to make the call on whether they're going to mandate, use the stick. And even there, um, the courts will often tell them you can't do it. The Interstate Commerce Clause, for example, is a huge, huge problem in trying to regulate packaging or anything moving across state borders. So short answer is it's very complex. And I think we decided that the best way we can do it is with example. You know, we've got an actress that helps us, Renee Russo, on native plants. People listen to her education and subsidize. And yeah. Back to population. That's a really good question. But as, as uh, Ron mentioned, you cannot control commerce locally. There's federal laws. We also have the US Constitution. And the Constitution <coughs> guarantees every one of you the opportunity and the choice to live anywhere you want. All of you can graduate from Loyola and leave California. And there's no law that says you can't do it. Conversely, there are people who will continue to come into Los Angeles and come into California, and our population is going to grow. In 1997 and in 1998, uh, DWP did two demographic studies, one on the water side and one on the power side, to take a look at what was going to happen in populations from the year 2000 to the year 2020. Both of them, independent from one another, came to the conclusion that within the city of LA, I'm not talking LA County, Southern California, California, I'm talking within the boundaries of the city of Los Angeles, our growth rate was going to be 1.5% per year. Now, if you extrapolate that out from 2000 to 2020, that's a 30% increase in growth. In numbers, that means about 4 million people going to about 5.5 million people. It's going to happen. There's, the law is such, our constitution is such, there's nothing you can do. It's going to be a, com a combination of immigration and birth rates, as was uh, noted. The people are going to be here. Well, and, wh and whether... And what is going to be the reaction to this population growth in order to curb the waste that will be produced from that? I know it's going to grow and people can move if they have money. I mean, the other these poor people can move if they have a choice. But on average... Uh, Aren't we producing more waste per person less than ever before? Or are we managing well, it? Well, no, I, th I think if you look at the net, we are producing less waste per, per, per person because of the tremendous amount of recycling. To, to answer your question, the, the way we're going to manage it on the wastewater side 
is, uh, as I've said, and Ron talked about, but certainly what uh, Dominic's talked about for DWP, and as an organization we promote aggressively and have for the last <clears throat> 40 years, you're going to need to get over this psychological hurdle that you shouldn't be using reclaimed water. You're going to have to use more and it's more reclaimed like water. It's he just told us. Yeah. But, but <laughs> instead of... Instead of, say, instead of saying, well, it stinks, shut it down, then I, the engineer in me says, if it stinks, find the problem and correct it. Solve the problem. Because the use of the water uh, is far too valuable uh, to, to not uh, take a... And, and, and can I have a contrary opinion, if I might? Sure. And, and Ron disagreed with me earlier, and, and uh, now I have to agree with Ron. I believe Ron. I kicked him under the table. No, I believe Ron's analysis with regards to water. I'm not talking about waste, and I'm not talking about any other resource, but with regards to water, I do believe that the future will be, will be good. Uh, and it's, it's this fact, and please, this is one, one statistic you should keep in mind. In the state of California, all of the water that is used for human use is called developed water. Of all of the developed water within the state of California, 83% of it goes to agriculture right now. Agriculture is 6% of our gross state product. So we're using 83% of the water to create 6% of the value in our society. That's not going to hold. That's going to change. There will be factors. There will be visionaries like Ron who went to Sacramento, negotiated with the rice farmers, and moved 200,000 acre feet of water from the Sacramento Delta down for urban and industrial and commercial uses here in Southern California. That kind of leadership is what's going to solve our problems, not elected officials. Luis, let's have a question right here. Um, I'm particularly uh, um, like, in, I have a problem with the beaches, you know, like um, sewage spills in particular, and how are we going to like, have the beaches be healthy for the people, you know, to even use them. Because I know that I live near the beach. I've lived near the beach my whole life, and I wouldn't get in that water. Just, it's just nasty. So, are you dumping now on the beach? No, I, I think the issue as far as wastewater treatment is concerned. But then this you, you showed, you showed, us, the, you showed us the map that had you uh, taking the, some of that waste out there, though, right? Well, it, it is treated wastewater. That is, meets that, is that the very, sticky water again? Uh, no, <laughs> it meets very stringent standards. As I said, you can, you, can, you can put fresh water into Biona Creek and let it stand there long enough with the runoff fertilizers, and you'll get the smell. The, this, you, you've got to overcome the issues related to smell and whether or not there's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in terms of the, beaching, the, the, the beach closures, um, as far as wastewater is concerned, what the city of LA puts out and what we put out, if you look at the report card that Heal the Bay has, almost all of those beaches, as far as the impact from wastewater, are rated A's. Rated A's. Uh, an A plus or an A. But there are, there are periods, particularly after rains, for two or three days, where a number of the beaches, people say, uh, there, there's, there's a problem, not people don't say it, you test it and there's a problem there. And that's from the runoff from streets, uh, from, uh, from animals, uh, and, and that is an issue that has to be addressed. But, but as we were talking before, if you go out and stand on Biona Creek, for example, in this huge rain, right, and you look at the amount of water that is coming down there, and you say, well, I want to treat that water. Okay, it's huge dollars, huge dollars. And where are those dollars going to come from? Dominic was talking about one pocket to the other pocket. And you say, well, I want to pay for that. Well, then it's going to come out of some pocket in the city of L.A. that's now looking at roads or, or other issues. But it's, it's, it is a problem that is at the forefront on the, on the stormwater side of it. That at the, it's at the forefront that is being argued at the governmental level. But I would say to you that Southern California beaches are as clean as they have ever been in, in, in their history, except for these periods after rain. I live near PV, Palo Verde, where you showed uh, one of those, uh, uh -huh. where you have a plant or something, I don't know, where you dump it in one. PV, yes, man, it's nasty water. It's, it's just, it's unsafe to even go in there. Torrents, that area. And then, you know, once you get to Redondo Beach, you know, and all that, you just can't, it's not really, like, healthy to even get in the water. And you, there's 
science even that says you can't get in the water because it's unhealthy. And even the Imperial Beach right here, like, you know, you can't get in the water. There. If you go around the Palos Verdes Peninsula, I'd like to know where the signs are because on the Palos Verdes Peninsula on the side where we discharge, the signs are not there permit, uh, preventing you from going into the water. So I really would like to know that. If you get down over to, to Rat, for example, I don't believe that there are any signs in there. If you get into Redondo Beach where the pier is, where they have, uh, used to have a storm drain going in there, and there's an enclosed body of water, yes, there, that's the problem when you get stagnation, as I was talking about. But if you go further down, uh, Hirondo, uh, and, and Hermosa and, and Manhattan, it's exceptional quality water. Now, I'm talking about, for the most part, except right after storms uh, for a few days. But other than that, I don't, think you'll find in, it's yeah, good. Don't get in the water after a storm. Hey, you know, one of the, one of the classes out here is a Chicano Studies class. So I'm going to ask you two guys, um, you know, how did you two guys uh, end up in water? I mean, uh, you know, young Mexican kids don't grow up saying, hey, I want to be in uh, the water, uh, I want to be a water executive. Uh, you, you know, how, how did that happen? And it's very unusual when you take a look at most of these infrastructure boards. There are very few, especially your generation, you know, where there were very few opportunities, especially in this area. How did it happen that two guys from uh, East L.A. end up uh, in these uh, very uh, important water uh, executive positions? Well, you're right. We didn't start out thinking that that's where we wanted to end up. I started out out of law school. Um, as a legal aid lawyer in a very poor community in Denver. And then I moved to uh, Gilroy, California, representing farm workers. And as I told you, it became very apparent to me that in order to affect lives of lots of people and to improve our economy for a long, long time, these basic infrastructure issues are hugely important. That's not for everybody. It just happened to really interest me, and I developed my interests there. Um, I, for many, many years, there were no other brown faces in the room. None. Except for, for me and, and then later on Dominic when we started working together. Uh, that's not true today. Um, I think that the industry is open, a lot of good engineers coming up, and it's really important stuff. But I think that certainly earlier on, the focus in college and Chicano studies was how do you get in the inner city and deal with issues that were right in front of us? You know, schools and discrimination and, and, and things like that. And uh, I did that for a while, but ultimately I moved off into the area that I'm in. It's been great. Actually, I started in solid waste, maybe before you did. I started in solid waste in 1962. Um, I was a trash collector. And um, I, uh, I worked in landfills before they were called sanitary landfills. They were called dumps in those days. And they were dumps. And... Uh, and I worked as a trash collector as I was uh, working my way through college. Uh, in college, uh, I had a, a, a good professor, much like Fernando, who uh, knew a little bit about history, and um, I wrote a paper on Mulholland. And believe it or not, uh, even when I was in college, I had an awareness and appreciation for DWP that has lasted with me my entire year, my entire, my entire life. And uh, in 1980, when Mayor Bradley asked me to serve as a fire commissioner, which was the first of my uh, commission assignments for the city, uh, even then uh, I knew at some, at some point, at some opportunity, that I was going to serve on uh, DWP. I knew it. I just knew it. It was, it was something of great interest to me. I care an awful lot about it. Uh, I understand the interwoven nature uh, between DWP and the leadership and, and, and the investment in the infrastructure and the development of the city of Los Angeles is so intertwined that um, it was irresistible to me. I mean, obviously, in, in addition to DWP, he served on the Harbor Commission, the Coliseum Commission, the Transportation Commission, the Harbor Commission. Wreck and Parks. Uh, Wreck and Parks. So, yeah, didn't, uh, when the, you were on the Fire Commission, there were all kinds of fires that happened when you were on the Coliseum, the Rams and the Raiders left. Um, every, time, every, every time you've been on a commission, there's been a problem. I, I've just I realized that now in terms of all these, uh, well, that's a coincidence, isn't it? And then we're not, now we have this rate increase with you're on the commission. Actually, the, uh, the, the Raiders left after I left the uh, Coliseum Commission. Um, the uh, the uh, harbor uh, reached uh, revenue heights that have been unprecedented. 
uh, uh, from the time I served. Uh, you don't have to defend yourself. No, I know. And, uh, and fires, and I will tell you this about fire, about the fire department. Uh, all of you should, uh, next time you go by a fire station, just take a look at those people and think about what they do. It's an incredible, incredible uh, profession, incredible opportunity to serve on that commission. Yeah, a, lot I was, of the, a lot of the women do go by and think about what they do. It's just like, <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, That's how it goes. <laughs> no, I mean, let, me, let me finish on that. Okay, well, we'll I was on. president of the fire commission when we hired the first women. And we changed the rules and changed a lot of things and created some interesting career opportunities. Okay, got time for two more questions. One over here and then one over here. Uh, for Mr. Sala, I was curious to know if there are any development opportunities for the metropolitan waste areas or waste sites. Uh, you know, are you able to put golf courses or cemeteries or shopping centers? I don't know what kind of opportunities lie for those places and if those are safe to do that. Kind of yeah, stuff. what happens to old dump sites? Ron, you closed one down. Mm -hmm. What happened to it? Well, Jim is as well. Um, relatively limited use. It's got to be open space um, where it's solid ground because trash does compress over time. You can develop uh, compatible uses, um, recreational uses. Um, and the landfill gas, um, Jim can tell you a lot more, is a tremendous fuel that can generate electricity um, and is, is essentially a renewable resource. There are, many, there are many examples of uh, closed landfills that have been put to uh, uh, multiple purpose uses. Uh, there is a, uh, a, uh, a park, a multiple purpose park in the city <coughs> of uh, Rolling Hills Estates where there are baseball diamonds, uh, uh, equestrian center, uh, and it is located on a former uh, landfill. Um, there are uh, places where golf courses up in the city of uh, in the city of Glendale, they have a golf course uh, on, a, uh, on a former landfill. Uh, those of you that uh, have ever gone up through Sepulveda Pass, um, you'll see a road winding up through there. The Mountain Gate Country Club uh, is built on a, uh, on a uh, former landfill. So it can be done, and um, in some ways, uh, you can look at the former landfill site as dedicated open space, if you want to call it a, a golf course, or, or just open space in general. Because I can assure you, with the premium on uh, home sites in Southern California, if it wouldn't have been a landfill, it probably would have been a heck of a lot of homes by now. So from that standpoint, I, I, I honestly believe that there is a, a societal benefit in the long run, um, and in the short run, not only for refuse disposal, but ultimately in terms of the use of the of the site, and it, it can be done. Not that there aren't cases where there have been a lot of problems, but you know that, that I, I don't care what you're in, uh, political science, psychology, uh, you name the, the, the field that you're in, and you're always gonna be able to look at an outlier and say, well, look how bad this is. But there are far, far more good stories in the problem nowadays, and in fact, all the time, the problem is the good stories often don't sell, and so you don't hear an awful lot about them. Any other questions? Anybody else besides David? <coughs> no? Okay, last question. Better be a good one, David. <laughs> Go ahead, you could talk loud. <laughs> Very loud. Question, and I don't know who, you know, which one would be the best answer. About, about drinking water, tap water. Um, Let me, let me, let me, let me. If you notice, if you notice with all of our previous uh, panelists, we always gave them bottled water. But this group, we gave them DWP water. So <laughs> happily, and, and, and happily I've been drinking it. No. Which, which brand are you drinking? This is Arrowhead. Arrowhead. Well, I'll give you. I'll give you. Well, I actually filled this up from a Brita filter that I filtered the tap water. <laughs> how frequent? How frequently do you change a filter? When's the last time you changed a filter? Oh. I guarantee you, it was not as recently as we filtered the water that's coming through there. But it tastes better than the water that's coming out of 
Is that, I mean, that's well, let me, let me, no okay, question. let me, let me I deal with that. Yes. The water, the water that you get within the city of Los Angeles comes from multiple different sources. As Ron mentioned to you, some of it comes from the Colorado River. Some of it comes from Northern California and the Central Valley Project. Some of it comes from local groundwater uh, wells that we have primarily in the San Fernando Valley. And some of it comes from the Eastern Sierra. All of the water that comes to the city of Los Angeles comes with certain assets and certain liabilities. The waters are different. They're very, very different. And what happens is all of the water has to be treated to federal standards, to state of California standards, and to um, drinking water standards that uh, we are all accompanied with. Now, there can be within the city differentials as to the water. If you live in the North San Fernando Valley, your water source is going to probably be a combination of Central Valley water and the, uh, the water from the uh, Eastern Sierra. If you live in San Pedro, if you live in Wilmington, if you live in uh, Harbor City, uh, a lot of that water is going to come from the Colorado River from our two intakes that we have with the Met in the uh, south part of the city. So you can have differentials. We do an awful lot with, uh, with uh, chlorine and now going to chloramines to, uh, to treat the water, to, to make the water meet standards. However, uh, you, can, you can, at certain times of the year or under certain circumstances, see or taste differences in the water. For example, uh, depending on where you're at in the city, if you go to your shower and you close the shower up and you crank on the hot water and you turn it on to hot water with no cold water and you let it really run real hot and steam up, uh, you can get a slight chlorine smell uh, uh, that comes from the evaporation of chlorine as it comes out uh, in the hot water. You won't experience that with cold water. Um, you do the best you can to deal with that. Within the city of LA, to try to address that, we have gone on a 20-year program of uh, sleeving our uh, main trunk lines and our feeder lines, and we also have uh, uh, cement lined the inside of the <coughs> water pipes throughout the city of Los Angeles. We're about 95% done with that. And uh, when you take a water pipe over time, you'll, help, you'll have the buildup of chemicals primarily, uh, calcification and other chemicals, and that can affect over time the way water tastes. Well, what we've done is we come through with, a, with this rotor rooter system and you clean out the pipes and then you put a machine on the inside that puts a thin lining of cement that prevents that from happening. And uh, we think that uh, we're doing a good job uh, trying to address that. So, so when we get the water quality from the sources, how, is it filtered before we get to it? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Is the, it primarily chemically? We have about 10, we have 10 seconds, Ron. Okay. <laughs> 10 seconds. Different waters just taste different because of the constituents. Our job is to give you healthy water. Our water doesn't necessarily taste as good as bottled water. Their job is to try and convince you that their water tastes better. That's why they make a lot of money. Uh, and, and getting back to that, the reason I asked you which brand, some of you drink Crystal Geyser, Crystal Geyser water, Alpine water. I, I don't know if it's the same, you know, it's the same as all the rest of these bottled waters. Where does that come from? It comes from Alantia. Where's Alantia? It's at the bottom of the Owens Lake. How is that water anywhere different from DWP water? It's exactly the same water. Well, they run it through an additional filter. Yeah, they, they do. They yeah. do to try and improve the taste. That's where we're going in our industry. We will continue to filter. We're going to ozonation now as the next level of filtration at all our treatment plants to try and address ozonation. ozonation. That's ozonation. right. Hey, let's give our panelists a big hand. Thank you.